Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for joining the conference call, Edge Invest Newman Credit Fund update and market outlook. Uh, as you know, Edge Invest Newman Credit Fund is our long-short credit usage fund. I'm sure you received a quick presentation just to support the investment outlook. Filippo will provide, uh, Filippo Lanza, portfolio manager of Edge Invest Newman Credit Fund, will, will provide the um, um, outlook and uh, an update uh, on the portfolio. And the end of the conference call, there will be the possibility to, to pose questions to Filippo. Now, we'd like to turn the conference over to Mr. Filippo Lanza, or Filippo. And uh, now, please, Filippo, go ahead. Thank you for your time, Filippo. Thank you so much. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Stefan, for the introduction. Um, and thanks, everybody, for being on the call and taking the time. Um, I will uh, hopefully you guys have the um, presentation that we sent out this morning. Um, sorry for we couldn't do it before. Um, I'll just follow the presentation just uh, as a as a supporting tool, but um, obviously the idea is to make it as interactive as possible. So I try to leave some time uh, for questions and 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 any issues that you guys want to discuss in more details. Um, we dedicated the first page to what we call the reflection drivers. Uh, we think some of them are gaining a decent amount of momentum, um, not just in Europe, but also globally. And uh, with that in mind, we should remember the old saying of never fight central banks. Uh, I think that has been interpreted recently, especially over the last few years, as never uh, short government bond security because central banks are buying them. But I think we need to be a little bit more precise and understand that central banks in the end uh, want to create some inflation um, because that is the, i.e. bring back inflation to the around the 2% level because they view that as the precondition for price stability, which is the ultimate mandate for most central banks in the world. Um, in the case specific of Europe, that's the only mandate that the ECB can rely on to justify any, any sort of actions. Our observation at the moment is that there is quite a few uh, drivers that are moving uh, to a reflation trade intended as in um, moving away from the purchase of government bond security. And this is particularly true in Europe right now. The main driver that we see is some sort of rebalancing at the, uh, on, on the commodity complex and any sort of energy, uh, especially oil and gas uh, production uh, sector that has been going through like a proper uh, wave, repricing wave over the last few years uh, following the decision of uh, Saudi Arabia to actually increase uh, the production to then uh, reduce the incentive to um, invest more into new uh, oil and gas generation capacity and uh, exploration activities. At the moment, we see a decent chance of some sort of an OPEC deal, and irrespective of that, the intrinsic the dynamics of the uh, oil and energy sector point out in any case to a rebalancing of demand and supply that should be quite supportive for prices. Currently oil is hovering around 50, um, which is uh, uh, almost double the low point that we reach uh, in the last 12 months. And obviously there is a decent chance that uh, on its own, it will probably reach uh, mid 50 kind of level and potentially an OPEC deal could actually push it even higher. At the same time, if we go um, internally in terms of policy makers, obviously a lot of focus is on monetary uh, policy uh, makers, but we like to uh, focus our attention on the fiscal policy side. Um, on that, we realize that uh, most fiscal policies across the world are becoming more expansive, uh, whether it's by stealth or by design, and the pressure coming from the electoral calendar and immigration influx are definitely pushing government programs into that direction. This is true for Europe, but it's also true for the US, uh, where I think one of the few items where both candidates sort of tend to converge or agree is the need for a more aggressive fiscal policy going forward. Away from that, we uh, look at the monetary policy. Um, clearly, 
uh, our sense there is that the monetary policy across where is Japan or Europe or US is hitting uh, what we like to call a wall of obstacles, a multidimensional wall of obstacles. Um, the uh, unintended effect of having negative rate across uh, such a large market capitalization of the bond market um, is clearly um, creating a decent amount of cost uh, for monetary policy. Obviously, those are particularly true for banks, uh, but it's also expanding now and contagion in a way um, uh, the insurance sector and even the pension plan uh, sector. So that is definitely becoming an issue. At the same time, uh, the other issue with monetary policy is that uh, away from some sort of repricing inflation expectation coming from the oil and oil and gas sector, it doesn't seem that the central banks are achieving their desired effect, whether in Japan or, or, or in Europe. And that um, makes more likely in our view that central bankers are considering a reshifting or a shifting of their policy mix. We noticed that in Europe already, with the European Central Bank adding corporate bonds to their uh, list of uh, eligible security, and we think that was a quite, quite a meaningful impact. At the same time, we see now Bank of Japan trying to reshuffle a little bit uh, the, the the set of targets and set of uh, uh, tools they will try to use to achieve those targets. Uh, what I would like to say, and it's more like a, um, a theoretical scenario, is more like um, uh, an hypothetical scenario. But you, we may have a situation where central banks decide to uh, enter into a more aggressive kind of policy mix, uh, which could be like buying equity, like in the case of Bank of Japan, but it could also be um, buying MPL uh, potentially in Europe. And if they do that, that may also mean that they can reduce the reliance on the most traditional tool, which is the purchase of government bonds. So in present, that shift obviously would have a major, a major impact on fixed income market, and for two reasons. First, because the next monetary uh, policy may actually be a lot more effective in creating uh, the desired uh, combination of growth and inflation. And at the same time, secondly, obviously would uh, mean that the central bank doesn't need to buy the same amount or as many uh, government bonds as before. And this, if you want, that's one of the main deliverable of the Bank of Japan new policy uh, mix, is that they don't need, they, they, they move from a security price target uh, from the original volume of purchase kind of target. And that's quite, could be very, very meaningful. We then think that all considering both what's happening on the supply side, on the oil and gas security, uh, both in terms of their internal rebalancing and the potential uh, kind of open transaction. Then on top of that, we have the fiscal policy and also monetary policy mix changing. All of that is pushing very, very clearly in our view to um, a situation where the fixed income market is incredibly vulnerable to a negative shock. Um, we think that the current situation where people and investors like us buying government bond security at negative rate with the idea of uh, getting more money out of the uh, greater full kind of theory of having another guy purchasing those bonds is very uh, is becoming very very dangerous especially if the assumption of the biggest buyer being central banks is something that could be very meaningfully changed and as we discussed many times with our investor we're very mindful of the time lag that we've seen between different QE policy uh, programs. Um, it, it took years for uh, other countries to copy the Fed and, and, and act like them. Uh, but if we notice, for example, in the case of ECB, ECB has had to upgrade their policy program several times already in response to whatever was happening either in China or Japan or, or in US with the, the delayed uh, um, interest rate hikes. So we do think that if there is a, a way from the other driver where, where is oil or fiscal policy, but even if we just restrict our analysis to central banks, if any central bank, and maybe Bank of Japan is the most likely, but if any of those central banks uh, move away from the current uh, extreme on the monetary policy continuum and, start, and they start venturing into more aggressive stances, 
that could very much mean that the central banks is abandoning the old traditional tools and that, as we discussed before, could have a double effect on the fixed income market. So we're quite, we're very, very negative. We think we're getting clo very, very close to an inflection point, which could literally trigger an unwind or a partial unwind of, of the last decades of, of bull market in fixed income security. And this is particularly true on, in Europe. Uh, with the ECB, obviously, which is probably the most constrained by far in terms of mandate, uh, and where the backstop facility would then become the OMT if the inflation expectation were not there to justify the, the ECB action. We do expect ECB will go into some sort of tapering announcement over the next couple of months. Uh, we doubt it's going to be October already, but I think they will start preparing the market towards that, that, that direction. Um, page three, which is the following page, we just tried to kind of put um, uh, some of the inflation drivers and some of the, um, the, the, the dynamics about uh, fiscal policy in, uh, in one simple chart. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the oil and food deflationary effect, and you see how that was impactful uh, over the uh, previous years, and now they sort of normalizing. And then at the same time, we look on the right-hand side, the fiscal policy mix and the, and the impact on fiscal policy over deficit, deficit GDP ratio, and that obviously has been plateauing over the last um, couple of years as well. So all of that, I mean, many times we have this question, we don't have an answer, probably only historians will, will, will find it, but clearly a lot of the focus we had on deflationary pressure has been structural, it may have been uh, wrongly placed, and we may be in the presence of something which is a lot more cyclical than, than structural. And if so, it would obviously be, uh, be re, um, reinstated over the next uh, few quarters with a mean, mean reversion kind of movement on either inflation expectation or fiscal policy. If we look at Europe specifically on that page four uh, that we dedicated to the, the presentation, if Obviously, there's a lot of focus on Japan. There's a lot of focus on Europe. Uh, there are very big uh, macro blocks where clearly policymakers are struggling with, uh, with the achievement of their targets. But if we think about the most likely candidate to be really tested um, aggressively by the markets in terms of their ability to manage a reflation trend, it will probably be the United Kingdom. We think it's by far the most vulnerable country. Um, we see the uh, and that's post Brexit, and the reasons are several reasons. First of all, we think soft Brexit, the chances of that clearly disappearing. Whatever attempt has been made by the UK government to uh, achieve that via separate negotiation it has, hasn't really yielded any, any results. And then the current cabinet, after the first 100 days of sort of honeymoon, is clearly moving to a more um, meaningful kind of uh, response or accountability, if you want, to the sort of backbench and the more convinced Brexiteers. We do expect in the short term, um, in terms of calendar, we'll see the first budget by Philip Hammond the, the, in the next, uh, over the next couple of months, um, probably a mid, mid end of November. We think it's going to be very expansionary, very much focused on expenditures to support the economy rather than the rebalancing of the books, which has been the main uh, target over the last few years. Uh, it's been announced over the weekend that the Article 50 will be triggered before the first end of the first quarter, uh, which then makes it overlap with the, the first round of the French election, and which is probably the worst time in terms of uh, reception of that sort of uh, Article 50. And at the same time, it was announced that the Great Repeal Bill will be um, formalized at the Queen's speech in the spring of 2017. Uh, we do think there's been an enormous amount of complacency around this situation. Um, is uh, something that for us is becoming probably the most overvalued portion of the fixed income market. Um, is a, it's been a core short of us and actually something we are adding. Uh, we think there's going to be a moment where businesses and investors will start acting, discounting the potential scenarios. Um, which of, of the post-Brexit or Brexit kind of negotiation. Um, the risk of a hard Brexit will be, uh, will be quite disruptive for a situation which is quite imbalanced already from a macro point of view, uh, where there is the structural deficit uh, to be challenged even more by expansionary policy, where there is the uh, balance of payments and, and, and trade balance of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, posi external position of UK, where there is the external position of UK as a net debtor in the, in the capital market. However, we look at it, we see plenty of, of vulnerability points. 
And so we are quite prepared for that. From a valuation point of view, um, UK assets, I mean, if you look at UK credit for swaps, um, they are very, very close to US. Um, they are probably, uh, the, the gap is measured in, in few basis points. Uh, so we think from a fair value point of view, whether we look at that, whether we look at financials, we see plenty of reason to be very, very wary. And the worst, obviously, of all the reflationary trend that we see is a combination of higher inflation expectations due to external shocks, oil or fiscal policy, and that is not followed by a meaningful pickup in terms of growth, and otherwise called stagflation. And we think of of the many counters that we can have a look at, at that kind of scenario, we think because of Brexit that UK may very much um, increase in the chances of that scenario happening. Uh, away from that, I think it's important, and that uh, we, we dedicated page five, six, and seven to uh, the the what are the sort of implication of our sort of macro picture on on the other two big sectors of the economy one is banks the other one is corporate on, on the banks bank side of the um, and, and i'm referring specifically about european banks now obviously uh, european banks have been very much the victims of the deflationary pressures on top of many other negative uh, dynamics inside the banking sector as uh, mr draghi repeatedly reminds us but we may see something, we, again, we may be very close to some of the, uh, a, a turning point on the bank side, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I, what I mean by that. Obviously, on, on the, on the left-hand side, we look at all the negatives that put European banks under pressure in terms of income generation and capital, capital uh, generation. Obviously, zero negative rates are becoming more and more a burden, uh, whether um, the banks are here or in Japan is true everywhere, but particularly in Europe, where net interest income should have been the major driver for uh, income generation and capital uh, accretion. The, we do see a lot of pressure there, um, even if there were some sort of reflation uh, movement, we don't think there could be meaningful enough to um, change completely the, the income the income dynamics of, of banks. Secondly, there is a, a decent issue with MPLs, particularly true for Italy and Portugal, but obviously the, the MPL uh, cleanup is becoming more and more difficult uh, given what's happening with the, in, in terms of equity market valuation, given what's happening with growth expectation, whether it's Italy or other regions of, of the periphery and uh, Greece included. Um, and then obviously we have plenty of regulatory pressure um, with uh, uh, Basel IV or not, or by mid-January 2017 should be should be enacted. And then we have the finalization of the MRI regulation and the new guidelines on SREP for 2017. That should be coming at end of this end of this year. So there is still a very very fluid uh, um, uh, regulatory picture, which again is increasing uh, the cost. Uh, for banks. And last but not least, obviously, given the, the, the recent press coverage of the Deutsche Bank case, obviously, the litigation redress risks, um, which the more the most uh, um, negative uh, voices see as overlapping perfectly with this sort of renewed tension at the trade, the regular tax level, which obviously a big confrontation again between the US and European Union in terms of uh, the treatment of, of, of the banks. All of that obviously are, are plenty of negatives addressing the uh, the banking the banking system in Europe. And at the end of the day, you can summarize that as in a situation where the banks do need more capital, um, whether it is to deal with the DOJ or whether it is to deal with the, the cleanup of the MPL. But obviously, the equity market makes it very difficult to raise money given the current price book uh, valuation. And on top of it, obviously, there is a decent amount of, of skepticism and concern about potential um, application of BBRD rules. Obviously, we've seen it last year, unfortunately, with Novo Banco. BBRD rules can be uh, applied and interpreted in a variety of ways, but some can be incredibly detrimental to the bondholders. And even if they will be proven as being uh, incorrectly applied or illegal in their in their sort of um, uh, implementation, that could still be years away. So obviously investors are very nervous and very skeptical. At the moment, we think, we think that we are getting to a point where policymakers, because of the cost uh, associated with the novel bank experience, and because the rigidities 
in the BBRD when it comes down to good, bad bank split and write down, they may be actually um, focused more and more on uh, the chance of having a, a soft bail-in or sort of uh, a greed bail-in, uh, which effectively um, ends up being a soft equitization. Similarly, very much so to what happens in the corporate world. So in the corporate world, if a company is struggling under the debt and doesn't have the ability to um, meet their own obligation, typically bonds, bond holders effectively get handed the keys to the company. And, and I think in 2016, we may see a relatively similar scenario where uh, bond holders, especially subordinated securities, will be offered a chance to recapitalize the banks. And terms and conditions which are not penalizing as if they would be in a good or bad bank split or in an eventual write down of securities. That could be very, very powerful um, because I think if we have a situation where banks actually get recapitalized, in, and they're going to be recapitalized by the bond holders, that could be very meaningful and very accretive. There will be a lot of coupon income being saved, um, coupon expenditure, sorry, being saved uh, by converting the bonds, and that could actually be adding it meaningfully to the um, equity market cap of the banks. Uh, and, and that also would save the problem of finding willing uh, shareholders to participate in a new capital increase given the low price book ratio uh, levels. Um, the reason why I'm discussing this is because I think both in the case of Monteparski and, and Deutsche Bank, we have a very, uh, very meaningful test of this theory for us. And I think on the way up, if it were to happen, it would be very positive in a, on an idiosyncratic basis in the short term for the specific bands, and it would be quite positive for the macro picture overall. But on the way down, if instead of seeing a, some sort of coordinated, uh, constructive, soft equitization, we were to see another repetition of a bank, I think only this time on a much bigger scale, whether it's Deutsche Bank or whether it's Monte Paschi, I think the repercussion for the market will be quite severe and they could uh, accelerate a, a meaningful repricing of financial securities. We're still hopeful that the template we will see with either Monte Pasca or Deutsche Bank could be a positive one. Uh, Pasca is, is on, I think is, is very well uh, discussed on the, on the financial press, but Monte Pasca needs $5 billion to effectively recapitalize the bank post the sale of their NPL to um, Atlanta and other investors. Obviously, Monte Paschi has more than $5 billion in subordinated securities that uh, may be involved in the recapitalization of the bank. So at the extreme, if it were like a corporate and you could transform those $5 billion into equity, you could have a situation where both the bonds would take advantage of that, but also the bank overall because they would effectively recapitalize the banks. Uh, the same thing we could say on the case of Deutsche Bank, uh, again, is not our... Uh, base case, but if you look at Deutsche Bank, everybody's terrified about the 14 billion request, but if for whatever reason you could uh, convert all their subordinated stock, which is accounting, which accounts for almost more than 30 billion of, of euro, if you could convert that into equity yeah, at sort of current market valuations, you could have a situation where the Deutsche Bank will be recapitalized in a very, very meaningful way. And there will probably be in a situation where they would be able to withstand even the worst case scenario with DOJ, but also they may even have the resources to then engage into a proper confrontation instead of being forced into a quick um, uh, settlement. All of those are more theoretical uh, scenario, and obviously they are brought to the extreme as a sort of intellectual provocation. But, but what is interesting for us to note is that uh, uh, with the current situation, where it's not just Pasqui and Deutsche Bank, it's also some of the Portuguese banks, some of the Austrian banks, there will be a scenario where the policymakers will need to uh, find a way to apply uh, the new rules and find a way to effectively merge in a constructive way both ba the old bailout kind of approach with the new uh, bail-in kind of procedure, where I think bail-in procedure may actually be used more as a as a as an end game kind of scenario to facilitate the uh, negotiated uh, conversion of different bond holders, and I think that could be actually quite. Uh, given the valuation of the equity and given the valuation of some of the, the bonds of those banks involved, it may actually that uh, there is a very interesting path whereby policymakers can actually create value for everybody involved. Obviously, that's the optimistic approach. The pessimistic approach is that we see a repeat, a repeat, sorry, of, um, of what we saw with Novobanco, 
only on a much larger scale, much more meaningful kind of uh, banking institution. And they obviously could be very, very negative for for uh, for the market in in Europe and, and generically, I think, for risk assets in general. Uh, but and they're close here on, on the bank side. I think we're very we're close to a very meaningful point where if that happens, they could actually open the opportunity for more mergers and acquisition to get the banks to the right scale, especially in, in, in Europe. So those are very, um, very interesting points and we're following all the stories very, very closely. Uh, away from that, um, we dedicated page six and seven to um, another strategy we're quite actively involved, which are events and mergers and arbitrage opportunity in, in, uh, in, in Europe and uh, globally, I would say. And we tend to look at those across the capital stack um, obviously, one positive of the zero or negative rate environment is that that allows company to fund a very low cost. It makes them a little bit more kind of aggressive, which was partially one of the aim of the central banks to reunite uh, animal spirits at the corporate uh, level. Uh, some central banks, obviously, is the case of ECB, they've been directly buying uh, corporate debt, uh, sometimes even through primary, and that's obviously helping credit spread comp compression. Uh, companies at the same time have been building a decent amount of cash, decent stash of cash, uh, and the restructuring plan clearly have been already enacted, and if they want to create more growth, uh, merger and acquisition remain one of the few few tools available. That's obviously quite interesting for us, and, and uh, because obviously there is plenty of M&A situation. M&A spreads are probably um, one of the few kind of asset classes which is still priced relatively generously, uh, given the event risk. And there's been plenty uh, of M&A activity that's been involving big, large companies with uh, very deep capital structure, both in equity and credit. Uh, because of that, we've seen some very good opportunity, arbitrage opportunity, uh, due to the fact that equity and credit tend to price those events in relatively different ways. Um, and then also because the exit strategy typically for equity uh, securities is very well defined, it's quite arithmetic, quite static, it's a number and typically it's paid in cash or shares of the acquirer. But when it comes down to credit, typically those M&A do not provision for a specific uh, cancellation or extinction or merger of the debt security with uh, across the different entities. So because of that, probability typically implied by the two markets are quite different and then they offer good opportunities. Um, on page seven, we put a, an interesting example where uh, if you look at both Bayer and Monsanto credit, they tend to price quite um, similarly, which for us doesn't really make much sense because obviously the capital structure of the two entities on a standalone basis is very, very different. Uh, but if I look at the credit pricing, it would kind of imply there's a very high chance of the deal being uh, successful and happening on the terms and conditions being announced. Well, obviously, if you look at the equity, that trade still has a decent uh, discount, I would say almost 25%, which is quite in contrast with a situation where the credit flows were for Bayer and Monsanto. They trade very much on top of one each other, only with a difference of a few basis points. So those are the kind of trades we like because we can have a small uh, funding, a uh, small positions are in the equity, which can fund a decent large short on the credit. And that ties very well with our view overall on the transaction, what we think Bayer is entering a very, very ambitious transaction with a lot of risk, which are not very well priced right now. Uh, and so it's good for us to have actually a larger credit short, which would then actually uh, su survive the transaction itself. Because if the transaction is ever successful, obviously we would exit our Monsanto stock for cash, uh, but we would still retain the credit short. And I think the credit short, as we've seen with the SAB Miller in Beva um, transaction, is something that would uh, offer mul uh, a multitude of opportunity um, for us on the long and short side over the life of the transaction. So there are some amazing opportunity there, and we notice uh, that the, the discrepancies between the credit and the equity market offer very good capital structure trades across the entities to effectively express our view on the event itself, either the merger or, or the acquisition, uh, with a, a much better risk uh, risk adjusted profile, and on this I conclude and I open the um, the session for any any Q and A or any any specifics that uh, item you guys want to um, ask to elaborate in more details. Thank you. Thank you, Filippo. Any questions? Excuse me, this is the Corusco Conference Operator.
We will now begin the question and answer session. The first question is from Eric Renander of Tara Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, Filippo. Thank you very much for the call. It's great stuff. Um, I just wanted to ask, do you see, um, it's interesting the view on commodities, and but do you see that possibly happening in the U.S. where, you know, we could go from, we could think where the flip to think, Thinking that the Fed is actually behind the curve, if you know, if you're saying energy picks up a little bit, inflation's already, I think, above two percent, and you know, we could be six months out and have inflation maybe two and a half. Uh, you know, could we? Do you think that concern also might happen in the U.S. or are rates just so much higher that it's not going to be as big a deal? Thank you for the for the for the question. I, I, in a way, I think the market is sort of thinking that rates are so much higher than everywhere else that it's sort of maybe not much of a big deal but on the other side i think uh, the fed has been as clear as possible in in saying that they much rather uh see uh, rate hikes being too late rather than too early um i think obviously the energy complex uh, dynamics are, are are creating very clearly inflation expectation going forward and and i think if i think about the most vulnerable central banks on that obviously the ecb because the ECB only has a mandate, which is price stability, which they decided to articulate as in the famous or maybe infamous target of that 2%, which has no macroeconomic uh, rational behind, but that is what they decided is 2%. Now, just with the rebasing effect of the oil complex, inflation in Europe in the first quarter next year will be very close, uh, sorry, very close to 1% to 1.5%. So... Uh, to me, of all the central banks, I think it's better to play on the others. But I think uh, if I look at the job market, then I would say that U.S. still offers meaningful opportunity. Um, but as I said, there are three big drives in our view. They really make inflation expectation uh, going into a direction that would create a lot of problems for central banks. Uh, one, obviously, is the oil and complex. Second is fiscal policy. Uh, if you look, we 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 trying to count the number of the world austerity is being used now versus a year ago, is being decreasing uh, substantially. Uh, and then thirdly is a situation where, and again, I'm just going to the extreme, but let's say tomorrow the ECB saying, okay, sorry guys, we keep on buying bonds, it's not working. If anything, we're upsetting our uh, German stakeholder, which is our biggest shareholder, and they got the election right now. Uh, we'll change tactics. We'll just go out and buy 500 billion of MPL uh, at whatever, 35 cents on the dollar. All of a sudden, if they do something like that, all of a sudden they don't need to buy government bonds anymore because they're buying MPL. But secondly, for the first time, the market will start pricing in that, you know what, this time actually they're going to make it. And uh, in a way, similar to what Bank of Japan has been doing. Now, the key thing to, to us in all of this is that it's a competition. It's a global competition across central banks. Most of you, they've been following us over the years. We don't believe in macroeconomic theory anymore. Um, and we definitely don't believe that central banks are independent agents. They are bureaucrats. They are paid by the government. They are appointed by the government. They answer to the government, especially in moments of difficulty and tension. So our view is that if any of those central banks decide to go down their route, and it could be Japan canceling that, doing helicopter money, it could be anything, uh, or Fed being too late, then I think for the other central banks, it will become very difficult not to move very fast and trying to catch up with the others. And we've seen that over the last 10 years, then since 2008, uh, it took years before other central banks adapted to the Fed. But if you look at the ECB from March, since March 15, they already adapted to either the Chinese devaluation or the um, Fed not hiking rates by including corporate bonds, by considering the new issue, issue limit, all that kind of stuff. So there is the aspect as well on top of what we see, which is we are in a truly global economy. And I think central banks' action will have to be um, effectively uh, competed away over the next few quarters, if and when somebody moves. Thank you, Felipe. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay, no other question. Thank you so much, Filippo, for your time. Thank you to everybody. And uh, at your disposal, if you have uh, any other question after the, the call, uh, please send us an uh, email or call us. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.